This is Global Mining News, available worldwide on the internet. Welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli, and it is Election Day USA. Once every four years, I guess we can call it the biggest election in the world happens, and there's always the cliche that this is the biggest election of our lifetimes, but I think whatever side you find yourself on, I, f- I think everybody's feeling that way. So we don't have live coverage. Uh, we're not there yet. If they were talking more about coal and copper and all these things, maybe maybe we would actually get some live blogging and some live coverage. But issues are a little bit more kitchen table, meat and potato issues. Interestingly, when we look at the markets, I see wait and see mode. I see people raising cash. We saw a bit of a pullback in the S&P. We saw a pullback in gold. Let me just look. What do we have? I have this right here. Making the computer work overtime here. Gold, yeah, a little preview. Gold unchanged at $1,899.17, 29 cents lower than last week's quote. And uh, we saw that across the commodities. So that really says it, doesn't it? And the week before, it hadn't changed much either. So I think the sense is raise some cash. Maybe you can get an opportunity. You don't sell everything uh, because whoever wins, I think once it's resolved, There's a sense that this thing's going up, but that we are likely to hit some turbulence here. Uh, Let's see. If it's a clear win, then it may actually just be off to the races for this market. Uh, But a lot of huge questions nobody knows the answers to. So markets in wait and see mode. And speaking of markets, it's really interesting. The mining companies have begun to report their earnings even at $1,900 gold, that is really high for a lot of these gold miners. So we're seeing some blowout earnings reports here. And it's not just high metal prices. It's also a low oil price. So miners are in the sweet spot right now. If your mining company is a producer and things are going well and you're not making money in this environment, I don't see more favorable circumstances than this. I don't see how it gets any better unless, of course, metal prices go higher and oil prices go lower. But if anything, oil is going to go up in the next year, stay the same. Can it go much lower? So really interesting stuff going on over there. In the coming weeks, I want to take a look at some of these earnings calls because I think they're going to be super interesting to look at. But for this show, we have Professor Dennis Buchanan, and this is kind of like on our jobs theme He is a senior research fellow and director of the MSc in Metals and Energy Finance in the Department of Earth Sciences and Engineering at Imperial College London. And he also does work for Edgemine. He's put a couple of courses together. So we're going to talk about that. And Edgemine, I guess you could call it a sister group to the Northern Miner. And uh, they've had a lot of success. They've been doing it for a long time, as uh, Dennis will point out in the interview. And, you know, it's come up just in my everyday conversations, this idea of training yourself as you go throughout your career path and, and how crucial that is. And sometimes there's no obvious places to go. You know, it's not as obvious as it would sound. And so Edgemine is really good for people who are in mining and who are looking to just get that upgrade. They put it on their CV, get a little bit more knowledge, get a little networking. And really, I, I'm a big believer in the in a lifelong education, and that includes building up your skills. That's what I got taught in ancient philosophy class. Good old Professor Kevin Corrigan uh, stressed the importance of a lifelong education, and that's probably maybe the most important thing he taught. Uh, he taught a lot of interesting things. Neoplatonist, very interesting guy. Shout out to Kevin Corrigan, who I think he's at Emory College, and that is in Atlanta, Georgia, I believe. And yeah, he gets paid to think, as far as I understand, research chair, brilliant guy. And 
Finally, we have the Global Mining Symposium is coming up. That is only a week away. So best sign up now. If you go to northernminer.com slash GMS, let me just bring this up. You will see a big blue button that says register for free. And there is still the sponsorship button in orange. I, they may take some late sponsors here. And you can click on that. You can see the preview. And here we go. We have David Elliott from Haywood Securities, Serafina Iacono from Grand Columbia Gold, John McConnell, Victoria Gold, and David Rosenberg of Rosenberg Research. Uh, with his outlook, we have Yogan Apal Raju, who is cybersecurity leader at EY Canada. And yeah, they actually have quite a few. Wow. They have really bulked up the, they have a guy from AWS, Nolan Finch, worldwide technical leader for mining at AWS. So yeah, do check this out. A few other people's from EY and EY used to be Ernst & Young and they have been doing a lot of rounds. This is impressive. They have really bulked this up. We have uh, Effie Semanicus from I Am Gold. We have a ton of people. The C president and CEO, David Ray from Dundee Precious Metals. And many, many, many more. They've really added to this. So you can register for free and you can ask them questions. This is your chance to dialogue with some of the luminaries of this, you know, small but important industry. So that is coming up, northernminer.com slash GMS. Sign up today. And it is taking place one week from today on, let's just look at the countdown clock. Wow. And look at this, Thought Leadership Partners, AWS, Ernst & Young, Zeris, OpsGuru. That is amazing. Silver Sponsor, Hardline. Yes, and this is in seven days, five hours, and 57 minutes on November 10th and 12th, 2020. So do check that out. That sounds just, uh, these guys outdo themselves every time in the events team. And with that, if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner. You can find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. And you can also find us on YouTube where we host these podcasts. Sometimes we put up the video interview of the podcast. We start, We did that with Jeffrey Christian. And also you can find us wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify and SoundCloud and Apple Podcasts. And with that, let's turn to the news. And turning to the website, we're turning to what seems like the one economy in the world that is actually doing okay, China. We have a couple of stories on China here. And the first is this report by Fitch Solutions. And they put out a report saying that China has a new infrastructure plan, which they expect to boost metal demand. China's acceleration of its new infrastructure plan will support the government boosting production of high-end metals as opposed to primary metals. It says here they're boosting production of high-end metals as opposed to primary metals, according to Fitch. And they continue, despite this being a long-held strategy of the Chinese government in its shift from export-oriented growth to domestic consumption... The focus on high-tech infrastructure has been more concentrated in 2020, following a slowdown in economic activity arising from the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as heightened tensions between the U.S. and China. Fitch predicts this new infrastructure plan will work in tandem with China's other industrial policies, such as Made in China 2025 and China Standards 2035 plan, which together signal the country's ambitious long-term strategy of becoming the global leader in high-tech and innovative industries. You know, I was just watching an interview on YouTube, and it was with a China expert, and it sounds like they've actually passed the U.S. in many of the technological areas, and chip-making, the one where they aren't ahead, they are throwing a ton of money behind these things. So they are determined to become the global leader. Continuing on, new infrastructure projects, including 5G networks, data centers, and artificial intelligence systems, together with transport and energy infrastructure, namely ultra-high voltage technology, charging stations, and high-speed rail, require a substantial amount of metals in their construction, Fitch says. Fitch believes that Chinese domestic demand for high-end copper, aluminum, and steel will face a strong boost 
from 2020 onwards, along with the government's existing ambition to move up the metals production value chain and strengthen the market share of its metal-producing state-owned enterprises, which have the technical know-how to manufacture these high-end products as compared with smaller private players. The technical expertise and financial abilities of large metal SOEs will ensure that they emerge as the biggest beneficiaries of this move up the value chain. And then they put out some numbers. So I think the moral of the story is they plan a major infrastructure boost. Let's take a look at this. We have an editorial from Editor-in-Chief Trish Saywell. China's five-year plan prioritizes tech and domestic demand. So let's take a look at this and see what we gather when we put these two stories together. China's top leaders gathered for four days behind closed doors to craft their 14th five-year plan for 2021 to 2025. The five-year plan has been a fixture of Chinese rule since 1953, shortly after the Chinese Communist Party came to power in 1949, and was modeled on the Soviet-style planned economy. Interesting. I mean, if on a national level... You make goals, just as individuals, if you make five-year goals, you're much more likely to achieve them. We have a bit more of a laissez-faire capitalism, as we say. The market will figure it out. But when you start putting government resources behind a five-year plan, yeah, it's almost like you do see the two systems eventually kind of combining. How does the West compete with a government that's making five-year plans and can start to boost, but still has the opportunity and the benefits of a free market. That's the issue for me. Uh, Let's continue here. The economic blueprint can be a bland document short on details, which are typically fleshed out later before being approved at the annual meeting of the National People's Congress in March. But what stood out loud and clear in the broad brushstrokes of the 14th five-year document is the importance Beijing is placing on self-reliance and innovation in technology, in particular strengthening China's semiconductor industry to provide the chips needed in high-end electronic devices and in everything from artificial intelligence and big data to 5G networking. And we have a quote from China's Minister of Science and Technology, Wang Zhigang, and he said, It is the first time ever in the history of our party's five-year plans that China is placing the plans on science, technology, and innovation before all other sectors. So if you thought they were being aggressive on science and technology before, they're about to amp things up. Continuing, we need to improve our ability to create things independently because we cannot ask for or buy the core technology from elsewhere. I think they're thinking, hey, we have over a billion people. We can have our own United States inside our own country as far as a consumer to buy our products. They're probably thinking, we don't need them. Zhigang continues, given new changes in the domestic and international environment, we need technological solutions more than ever, and we need to strengthen innovation more than ever before. So China is doubling down on tech, science, and innovation. So leaders of the world pay attention. You might want to do the same thing. Now, scrolling down a bit, the other major plank in the communique is boost growth by driving up domestic demand. And we have a quote, China has the world's largest consumer market, which also possesses the greatest potential. Xinhua, China's state-owned news agency, quoted President Xi Jinping as saying, the room for growth is huge. Right, so it's just common sense. If they're going to run into all these tariff issues, they're probably just going to say, we don't even, we can just cut these guys out. We have five United States consumers in our own country. We don't need these guys for anything. Now that they have the tech, also an interesting point here. Don't forget that while China is the world's second largest economy, roughly 373 million Chinese still live below, quote, the upper middle income poverty line of $5.50 a day. According to the World Bank, President Xi declared, Promoting common prosperity for everyone is a long-term task. We must attach more importance to the promotion of common prosperity, setting off with firm steps and making sustained efforts towards the goal. And according to Trish, this is all good news for the mining industry. And that makes sense. So 
Moving on, we were talking in our intro about these gold companies with their blowout earnings, and Yamana has just raised its dividend 50% on pretty big earnings here. This is by Cecilia Jamazmi, mining.com. Yamana Gold has reported positive third quarter results. Highlights include the highest operating cash flows since 2015 of $215 million. Year-over-year free cash flow up more than 300% and net debt declining a further $149 million. The strong figures allowed the miner to raise its annual dividend by a further 50% to 10.5 cents per share. At the new rate, the divvy will be 425% higher than the rate just 18 months ago. The company also increased its 2020 production guidance to 915,000 ounce gold equivalent from the previous 890,000 ounces, representing a 3% jump. Now, remember just scaling everything. Barrick, again, is aiming for 5 million ounces a year. Ignico is about 2 to 2.1 million ounces a year. Here's Yamana at 915,000 is going to be their new goal for this year. Just to give you a sense of how these companies stack up against each other. So the next day we got this story, which is that Yamana has acquired Monarch Gold for $152 million, also by Cecilia Jamazmi. She's on the Yamana earnings tip. Here it is. Humana Gold is expanding its footprint in the precious metal-rich ABTB region of Quebec by acquiring all shares in smaller rival Monarch Gold that it does not already own for $152 million, $114 million U.S. And the cash and share deals gives Yamana the Wasamec property, which is 100 kilometers from its 50% owned Canadian Malarctic mine, as well as the Camflow Mill, also in Quebec. Now, speaking of Yamana's earnings, I wonder how much is the Canadian Malarctic mine, which they're running with Agnico. And Agnico, you get the sense, is a very strong operator. So you wonder how much Yamana's prosperity is really built on this Canadian Malarctic deal. Monarch said it would first spin off its other mineral properties and certain other assets and liabilities into a new company. Once the transaction is complete, Monarch's shareholders will own 1.3% of Yamana and 100% of the new miner. Yamana will own 100% of Monarch. Now, scrolling down a bit, Yamana said the asset holds the potential to be an underground mine achieving the same scale, grade, production, and costs as its Jacobina mine in Brazil and its Canadian Malarctic mine in Quebec. Now, I don't think they would have said that to Monarch before giving them only $152 million. Because Canadian Malarctic sounds like one of the biggest, greatest projects in the last little while in Canada. Sounds like a very gold-rich region, doesn't it? To state the obvious. So you can read more about that on northernminer.com. Just touching on that. Now, bucking the trend was tech whose profits dropped 67% on weak coal prices. They saw their third quarter adjusted profit fall by 66.6% as steelmaking coal prices collapsed in the period and COVID-19 related restrictions continued to hit the commodities market. And so gross profits were 703 million in the third quarter compared to 1.22 billion in the same quarter last year. So they're still making money, but just not as much. Everybody likes growth in the stock market. So it sounds like the cost of coal fell to $67 per ton in the July to September quarter. So that impacted them. And tech said it anticipated the commodity would fall even further this year to below $60 per ton. And also their Cabrata Blanca project, which is in Chile, had to be suspended because of COVID, and the company estimates the impact from the suspension, including expensed costs, will be 350 to $400 million, with a scheduled delay of five to six months. The miner is also investing a further $45 million in additional camp space because of the coronavirus. So some big costs coming for tech. And so that's just a hint of what is going on with earnings season, which is just got underway last week for the miners. And this is also interesting. Rio Tinto is investing $51 million in a Canadian alumina refinery. And I just want to touch on this. The world's second largest miner, Rio Tinto, is investing $51 million to upgrade facilities at its Vaudreuil alumina 
refinery in Quebec. The company said three new energy efficient buildings are under construction and existing facilities will be rearranged to provide close to 400 employees with a centralized control room, offices, and common areas. So on one hand, you feel like, okay, great, they're making jobs. But then you look closer, centralized control room, offices, and common areas. So 400 employees. Now, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, that would have been 2,000 or something. Who, who knows? Who knows? The project, expected to be completed in 2021, aims to improve employee safety and optimize operations at the Saguenay Regions plant built in 1936. Again, it just sounds like robots are being introduced here in automation. You can't blame them for that as a business. These are secular trends going across the entire global economy. So Rio Tinto investing in upgrading their plants in Quebec. And with that, let's turn to metal prices, which are dramatic in their non-drama this week. Turning to metal prices, on November 3rd, Election Day 2020, gold is trading at $1,899.17. That is 29 cents lower than last week's quote, so almost unchanged. And the week before, it was trading at $1,900. So in terms of when we check these prices... There has been less than a dollar movement in the last three quotes, including today's. So that is interesting. Silver is at $24.21. That is eight cents lower than last week. And it is 18 cents lower than the week before. So you see almost zero movement in gold and silver in the last two weeks. Platinum is trading at $875.67. That is $3 lower than last week. Palladium is trading at $2,255.19 per ounce. That is $111 lower. So palladium is trading lower. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is eight cents lower at $3.04 per pound. Aluminum is unchanged at 83 cents per pound. Lead is unchanged at 81 cents per pound. Nickel is a little lower at $6.92 per pound. That is 23 cents lower than last week. Tin is 40 cents lower at $8.01 per pound. And cobalt is also lower at $14.74 per pound. That is 22 cents lower than last week. And zinc is a penny lower at $1.15 per pound. So as we were saying, drama in the non-drama, I've never seen the prices actually this static. I think we can assume this has everything to do with the uncertainty around the election. And people basically positioned themselves two or three weeks ago, and now they're just waiting to see what happens. And next week should be pretty interesting as we said at the top, markets in wait and see mode, and those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have Professor Dennis Buchanan, Senior Research Fellow and Director of the MSC in Metals and Energy Finance in the Department of Earth Science and Engineering at Imperial College London. And we discuss many things, including the challenges and the opportunity in online learning and the importance of upgrading your skills throughout your career and what it's like to teach with the coronavirus, Dennis's thoughts on gold. And if you want to find uh, the classes that Dennis is talking about, just go to edgeofmind.com. And again, they're a sister company to the Northern Miner. We're all under the Glacier Media umbrella. I was just there, and it's actually quite impressive, all the different things you can take there. So Dennis teaches a couple of the courses there in mining and finance, and he gets into it in this interview. So 
With that, here is my interview with Professor Dennis Buchanan, and we will see you on the other side. Professor Dennis Buchanan, who is Senior Research Fellow and Director of the MSC in Metals and Energy Finance in the Department of Earth Science and Engineering at Imperial College London. And Dennis, it sounds very impressive. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Adrian. Um, I welcome the opportunity to engage with you. You're welcome. Yeah. And uh, it, it came from one of our people at EduMine. Uh, who is affiliated with the Northern Miner and Mining.com and our parent company, Glacier. And so you're doing work at EduMine. So, and you put together a couple of courses. So tell me first just about yourself, how you got involved in this business and basically what you're up to. Well, very briefly, I started off uh, my career in the South African mining industry. I suppose I became an academic a little by accident. Um, but my... Uh, role is um, to, uh, I suppose my main role at the moment is as Director of Metals and Energy Finance um, and uh, looking at um, training the next generation of people who are interested in careers in natural resource finance. Um, there was a, a major seismic shift in 2008 where finance suddenly became um, central in everybody's minds, uh, and the importance of finance became, uh, I think, uh, increasingly apparent. Um, so I suppose over that period, my main achievement is to get finance recognized uh, as equivalent to conventional engineering. And so what I'm most involved in is a delivery of various courses and doing research in the area of financial engineering that relates specifically to the natural resources. So it's metals and energy. Um, it's not just the narrow uh, aspect of mining, but also uh, oil and gas um, as well. Uh, and within the energy piece, of course, the development of battery metals. Uh, so that, I suppose, my, my first degree was actually in, in, in chemistry um, and uh, with geology subsidiary. So is that enough? Is that uh, give you a little... Uh, yeah, that, that's a great... But that's relevant to this interview. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And tell me, um, how what just... Before we move on to beyond, in a sense, your personal bio, like what made you interested in this business and in chemistry? Like what, what was it that drew you to it? Well, I, I started with science, which I was interested in, and then working in the South African uh, mining industry, of course, this was I found pretty exciting, uh, and then worked through um, into um, an MSc and then my PhD, which is actually was in thermodynamics. And I did some theoretical modeling in the field of um, magmatic sulfides, and I applied uh, experimental work there, and I applied that actually to uh, the Platte Reef in South Africa and worked out with the uh, geologists on the ground a system of zoning. And uh, that actually was the uh, key to opening up the resource estimation side of things. And, of course, the Platte Reef is now the biggest open pit platinum mine in the world. And, and part of that, inevitably, one realized that finance was an essential part of all that. Uh, extracting rock from the ground was one aspect, but it's the uh, billions of dollars that needs to build the mines that I became interested in. And so that's the way my, my career evolved. And I, I think that uh, one should uh, look at uh, new things every now and again. You don't just stick, in my view, <laughs> just stick with the same thing, do things differently. And I suppose that's where I became involved with EduMine. Uh, is that uh, I started a company called uh, IC Finneval Limited, in which we marketed uh, sophisticated um, systems, applications for automating the generation of complex financial models. So the integration of the economic and accounting model and, and integrating that with uh, risk in terms of geostatistics and the stochastic approach that investment bankers used. And uh, Edumine and Infomine were uh, at the cutting edge 15 years ago in using the internet as a mechanism for um, promulgating new ideas. Uh, and so I've worked with them for the last 15 years, including in the transition now 
into um, working with Glacier. Okay, excellent. And could you tell us about Edumine? Like, what is Edumine? I think most people won't have heard of it who are, say, listening. There may be a few who have. What is Edumine and what are the services? Why would someone go to Edumine? Well, Edumine started with the uh, advent of e-learning. Um, where all the delivery would be online. It was confidently predicted that people like myself would become very quickly redundant uh, and we'd be relegated to the back room when we would just uh, write all our courses up online. Right. Uh, and to some extent, you may argue that that's finally happened, uh, but uh, it, uh, I realized, uh, probably wasn't the case 15 years ago. There's still no substitute for the face-to-face. -face. But I thought if I'm going to become redundant, I might as well, you know, uh, decide to be part of that uh, new fraternity. So I, I, that's why I got into e-learning. Uh, and of course, I discovered that it's a powerful delivery platform, but it's still face-to-face. -face. But then with the development of Finovel uh, and the development of uh, software as a service, um, this was before Software Hub, uh, we delivered the functionality, uh, Infomind did deliver the functionality of Minival, uh over on their systems. It was great. Uh, so our company flourished, uh, but you don't run a company for fun. So we dissolved it. It was never liquidated. Uh, so we dissolved the company. And Minival is now available just for people do license sell that anymore. So it's been a, a great working relationship. When Glacier took over, they, they had a, a look at the authors, those who were active and those that weren't. And I suspect those that were generating fee income. And they were kind enough to say that they were happy to keep me on. But in parallel with that, uh, I've always been running live courses, I mean, face-to-face -face courses in Vancouver and Toronto, where we'd have a group of 20 delegates, um, limited to 20, uh, usually. And, and the last course I gave face-to-face uh, -face was in Ulu last October uh, with uh, Edumine, where we had 25 delegates from all over the world with, uh, with uh, technical backgrounds, geologists, mining engineers, mineral process engineers, but also people in the financial services, uh, you know, for the boutique finance companies, investment ba banks, excuse me, and the like. Uh, and so I, I've now launched uh, the uh, same course, but doing it online. Uh, it needed quite a lot of work to uh, customize for online capability, but it's working well using the same system that we're talking on now, where we record the sessions. I have a uh, pre-record uh, the technical lectures so that I just focus in on the key things. And then we have a dialogue. And of course, the great thing is that we can, we don't all have to travel to Toronto, Vancouver, although some people, it's always a great pleasure to go to Vancouver in particular. But we, we do it uh, online. So we have people all over the world at different time zones. Uh, and uh, then people, have access to the online course and also to the book that I've written as an e-book. Uh, and the software hub gives them the functionality. So look, it sounds frightfully complicated. Yeah, but you know, it, it's all very intuitive. It just runs in the background, you know, and you, you could just have the same sort of conversation as we're having now. So tell me, though, in a, in a simple way, though, what is the mission of Edumine? Is it basically to provide mining education to people uh, or online would that be a uh, i would say in particularly in this this scenario it's continuing professional development we're all sitting at our desks uh, in our bubbles uh, wherever it is and we miss the interaction uh, and so edumine is just i think a, a superb platform um and i'm promoting it uh, edumine is a tool that i use it's just a superb platform where professionals can interact uh, across the disciplines, and, and, and the main theme that in all my teaching is that when mining projects fail, it, it is because um, something obvious has been missed, is that communication is broken down, interdisciplinary communication between the financiers, the lawyers, the mining engineers, the geologists. And so it's just a wonderful platform where we can all get together and, and have an intellectually stimulating discussion and also get the credits for our professional development. So that is, is my view that, you know, the role that EduMine is playing has always done so. And, and I think that even more so in the current circumstances. That's so interesting. I, I was just talking to my girlfriend the other day, and she's in kind of health and digital sort of communications in Germany here. 
And I think there's a real market for people that just want to upgrade their skills. Like, I mean, if you're already working, you're, you know, in your middle of your career, you don't necessarily want to go back to university for five years to take something. It's nice to take a little module, a little thing, and I go, okay, check, I have a nice little thing on my CV. I have upgraded my skills. Spend yeah. like, you know, two or three months or whatever it is. So, I, yeah, I think that's great. That's what you guys are doing. I mean, this is the point that people have made, is that, uh, you know, six months is about one's shelf life as an expert. You know, whether you, I'm told, and you're a surgeon, or indeed uh, doing the sort of things that I do. Uh, and and uh, you, you can't just afford to just furlough and go into hibernation for six months. You lose that intuitive feel for those skills. And, and I think people recognize that. Uh, and uh, they can do this at their convenience. Um, uh, it, we do it for four hours a day. But when, what is interesting with the MSC, we thought that would be a drop-off in applicants, but, but our applications have actually soared uh, because uh, professionals see this as an opportunity that yeah. if, you know, we're going into hibernation, this is a good time to upgrade uh, their, um, you know, professional, or at least their graduate qualifications with a master's or indeed their professional uh, development going online. But it's got to be good quality. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, what we're doing, uh, online delivery, distance learning, it's not a static, um, just playback on on a, a webcast. It has got a lot more moving parts than that. With the greatest of of of, of respect to you, Adrian, with your podcast here, uh, people are just playing this back, and they don't have the opportunity to interrupt me now and to talk you doing it for them. But of course, in this new platform, uh, you know, delegates can and are expected to interrupt and clarify. And I think that that is working for a lot of people. We're still on a quite a steep learning curve, including using this now to to supplement the the distance learning. That's so interesting. Yeah, I think everybody is getting uh, a lot more used to this video conferencing thing as a result. And it it might have seemed like I think there's a lot of people that just never bothered with their yeah. video camera on their computer until six months ago. Yeah, sure. And that little gap, I think, is just yeah. making it a lot more easy. Everybody knows how to do it now for the most part, so it's not a big deal. Yeah. I can sign up to that, and I won't go, well, how does this work? Now people kind of know how it works. Uh, so tell me specifically. Okay, can I just pick up on that theme? I mean, to do the interview, so if, forgive me. If I'm, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. But, you know, I, I worked for 10, 15 years to get this thing launched. And within two weeks so after close down at Imperial College, I'd achieved more in two weeks than I had in the previous decade because we just had to go onto these platforms. And, and initially, people were pretty, uh, you know, um, uh, unsure about it. But we're all on teams now. And, and, the, and the more time we spend on it, the easier it is then to actually explain the sorts of things that I'm doing now because it's just becoming now second nature. So I'm not sure that it, it just actually closed off that, that thread that you were that you develop them. Yeah, no, it, you can assume now that you don't need to send out a PDF on how to get your video camera working in your uh, computer and your laptop so that you can take a class, right? Whereas maybe a year ago, you might've had to do that. Uh, but talking more specifically, so you have developed a couple of courses, as you were saying uh, before our conversation uh, for the podcast here, you're saying you're an author of a couple of courses and I believe it was relating to mining and finance. Could you tell us, like, tell us about a specific course that you're doing? You, you have two courses you've done, or are you doing one right now? What are you up well, to specifically? Is that the, the EduMine e-learning is one which I wrote 15 years ago. I've ref refreshed it. Uh, and the EduMine course is linked to a, a, a part of that uh, uh, environment, e-learning. So you can then go on to the e-learning course. And it's got a, the, the clever thing about it is actually the multiple files. And um, there is a Q&A. So there's, there's a checklist that you, a series of, of um, questions that are posed. And if you get it wrong, it takes you back into the other course. So it's, it's an interactive. Um, so it, 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 it supports, as it was always done, the face-to-face -face and now the online. So after I've done the presentation, delegates and indeed students as well can go back 
and just check how effective my delivery has been. And if it, you know, they can then go back and check that. So those are the, the e-learning courses that I've uh, generated um, through on, on just on Ed, EduMind. Um, the, in terms of the, um, uh, the CPD courses, these were the face-to-face -face ones historically, which we ran once or twice a year. And the last one I did was an Ulu in October. So I'm now coming up to do the second one, which would be online. So that would be a, an online course. So the e-learning is just simply one of the tools that we use uh, to support, the, if you like, the flagship one, which it is uh, in real time online. Does that does that clarify things? It's somewhat, but I'm wondering, like, what is an, an example of a course that you're teaching? Like, what would I, if I'm looking to upgrade my skills yes. as a mining executive or mining engineer or whatever the case may be, what am I signing up for? What am I going to learn? What What's the name of the course? Well, uh, this one, <laughs> well, I have to check myself, but it's yeah, it, just the, one, you know, like mining the, the, and finance. It, it, or what? It's rather, a, it, it's not a particularly uh, catchy title, but to read the whole thing out is valuation of mineral projects based on technical and financial modeling. So apologies for that. Uh, it's a bit more long-winded, but it, but it does deliver what it says on the tin. And, and in essence, ultimately, particularly at the moment, uh, we everybody's hunting for yield, you know. Uh, how do we, we yield. cash yeah. around, you know, Adrian, I'm told, <laughs> not necessarily in my household, uh, but people need to uh, invest intelligently and natural resource projects or something which which really do offer a significant uplift. Uh, of course, there's a risk attached to it. And so what we're looking for is the intrinsic value of a particular asset. And that's what I'm covering in the evaluation course that we are going to run. It's an Edumine course to, to be delivered. Uh, and I, I think we're allowed to do a plug. I'm looking for the date. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. But uh, it's the 7th to the 11th of December. Uh, it's all right. online. So someone would go to edgemind.com and they yeah, might yeah, just go to yeah and look up valuation of mineral projects. And I'm sure that you have a clever enough technology to embed a URL of at course. this stage in your podcast. Um, so people going to that uh, can then just enroll on that uh, and they can participate it in the way that I've described. And and part of that is the financial modeling so that we can create models and indeed delegates will have this, the application which they can put into that, the uh, technical course that they may actually be looking at right now. And that's, in fact, what a lot of the delegates do, is they go away from this. Uh, and right. as, go one, right to work, right? Go, and they just start yes, I mean, one, of, one, of, uh, one of the best compliments I've ever received from a delegate in one of my courses, he said, it's one of the few that we can sit in on, Dennis, and go away when it's finished and make money from the principles that you've delivered. And I think that's a, a great, uh, great accolade to have received. So you could put your picture on a billboard with uh, with that sentence. <laughs> it, it, go away and make money from the principles and the tools that we provide. It, so it's very, that, it, yeah. Sorry, I, I was just going to say, it's very central. I mean, it's a, it, mining is a business, right? And there's a lot of, of different, it and it's, it's an interdisciplinary true. business, as you point out, and it seems to be valuation and assessing a mine's value. It's kind of the, really at the heart can do of the Very point. effectively, one distance. You know, if you're sitting in, in a mining environment with all the operational pressures and so on, uh, and even you've got a satellite deposit, it's actually quite difficult to step away from it because the phone's ringing, colleagues are coming in, uh, their production issues, and to be able to just step away and say, well, look, let's look at this in the round and get some sort of priorities and, and all the tools are available. And you can then you know put a cold towel around your head and sit down and say, what is the intrinsic value on this in terms of business decision making? And it's it's and all linking to finance and because no mine will develop it unless you've got that investment. And so it's it's opportunity for fund managers who have are sitting a, a looking for and it's attracting some very, very smart people. I mean, certainly the students on the MSC, you know, I leave me quite uh, nervous. I mean, they are very, very smart people. It's a new generation of people coming into the industry. 
natural resource industry and the finance aspect, uh, who are excited by all the new developments in battery metals and uh, the oil companies diversifying into energy and renewables and so on. I think it's quite an exciting day, and I, I feel privileged to be still part of it uh, and also the mechanism of delivering it. So a quick question on that, just to clarify. So when you say MSC, so are you talking about your, are you doing in-person classes at Imperial College in London we, right now? Yeah, uh, well, we call it on campus. On uh, campus. And there are elaborate protocols in place, but we, we, we've we announced right from the beginning it will be multimedia, which is a combination of on campus and online. Okay. And it's very interesting watching, you know, having launched the course uh, last month, uh, that about a third of the students uh, uh, want to be on campus. Uh, the other two thirds, and most of them actually come to London, they're not all online. Uh, and um, the other two thirds say, well, you know, we're getting just as much about the, from the online, um, but they will come in on campus because they just, you know, want to get out of their rooms. They're going, sure. you know, cabin fever. Um, but it it is uh, we've got to be very very careful. I, I feel safe on the campus. We've been very very cautious. I mean, I use a lecture room which normally accommodates uh, seventy students, and with the social distancing, I could, I've got a maximum of twenty, uh, and at that point. Uh, we people have to you know can't come in i've got to leave after an hour and can't go back in for half an hour because someone has calculated the viral loading and so on and so forth yeah. and so it, it's working um, i'd say surprisingly well i mean you know we pride ourselves in doing proper planning but it's working well and and uh, students feel that they have that opportunity to come on campus and that's great and i mean i like it as well it does Good to see, you know, a student in the three dimensions rather than in two. Yeah, I, I have to almost force myself to leave the apartment sometimes. So, yeah. And and then when you do, it's always a relief. It's like, oh, real people. Sometimes I don't realize I miss it. Um, so a couple of more questions. So just very quickly on the virus. I mean, here in Germany, we have a lockdown that's basically started today. They call it lockdown light. <laughs> But it's pretty, uh, I mean, restaurants and bars are closed. Mm -hmm. What's it like over there in London? Like, are have you been affected by the latest announcements? Or? Well, um, I personally uh, am not because, I mean, A, I live in the country. <laughs> I've got, you know, the most important thing is a, a good, fast uh, internet connection. Um, but, um, the, you know, the, the we, we heard last night from the Prime Minister that we're going into a second lockdown. But schools and universities are excluded, and you can go to work if you need to do so, but you're encouraged to work at home. Right. And, and to, as far as, uh, you know, Imperial, you know, I might, as we're sitting here, get an alert from my boss to say that uh, they are, um, you know, uh, uh, going into lockdown on campus. But that's not been the case. So we, we just sort of powering through this uh, latest surge, not through a sense of irresponsibility, but a commitment to the next generation. I mean, it's so important that anything that I have to impart from the 50 years that I've been in the industry uh, is an opportunity to, uh, you know, impart that to the next generation who have every right to expect a high quality education uh, and a prestigious uh, and a good degree. Uh, and so if you like, that's it's, it's, it's a vocation. And I, I consider myself very, very privileged to be able to be participating in, in the stage where we're able to provide that support. So that's that's a philosophy we have at Imperial College. Okay, so let's talk about the younger generation because this has actually become an ongoing refrain at on this podcast, and it's not even me bringing it up. It's this idea of there. There's a sense I've had from repeated guests that there's a dearth of talent coming into the mining industry because mining is seen as an unglamorous industry and that there's a real sort of problem of brain drain, shall we say, or a real lack of new talent coming in. Do you, you're on the front lines. Do you agree? Well, I, I frankly don't. I mean, as I've already indicated, I've got 30 one students uh, on this course of mine, and they certainly are uh, highly motivated. Um, my plea very often is to for the young engineers, and particularly geologists, to get some practical experience. 
uh, but all of them are attracted into, or most of them are into the financial services or new business development in both the major mining companies and in the oil companies, and also in the uh, boutique uh, fund managers, uh, boutique uh, financial services, and in the um, uh, private equity space. And, uh, you know, when I say, well, what about some practical experience? They say, you know, you're absolutely right, Dennis. I'm, you know, we, we should do what you did, which is go underground every morning and so on and map the face and uh, do all those sorts of things, which is all part of character building. Three years later, you wonder, well, you know, I, you know, I learned a lot, but, you know, yeah. uh, but they say, you know, we, we, we frankly got careers to develop and we just don't have that time. Now, there, of course, is a major issue on uh, production you know, in terms of extraction uh, and in, mineral, well, not so much in mineral processing, but in the extraction process in, in a mining operation. I'm well aware of that. Um, but that is just a, actually a, a, a small part. We can argue which is more important, you know, and I've worked in an operation where, you know, it's the geologists, you know, feel that the mining engineers don't know how to extract the stuff and the process engineers say you're not sending us or you're sending us waste and we have this lovely rivalry between the three professions but ultimately that is not something that the next generation get too involved in of course they recognize the importance of practical experience and i you know have the greatest sympathy of the mining schools are trying to track people into traditional areas of mining engineering but mining engineering is uh, about 5% of this course. We do give a full course in mining engineering, but we also give a full course in mathematical techniques and finance. And as importantly, we have spent as much time on financial accounting that, that all the students, I'd say the most important thing is to be able to read a P&L and, uh, and, and a balance sheet in a set of financial accounts. You know, you've got to. And, and you know, the next generation get it. They really get it. <laughs> so you guys yeah. offer that. Is that right? Like by Sorry? taking these classes, you can help me understand how to read a P&L? Well, it's an essential. They cannot get the degree unless they pass their uh, examinations in financial accounting. It's a standard alone paper, financial accounting. And, and the people that have the most difficulty of that with degrees in maths. So, I mean, on the course, we do have... Uh, uh, perhaps about a, a third of them are engineers, but including mechanical and chemical and so on. Uh, a third are uh, natural scientists, including geologists uh, uh, and physicists um, and uh, mathematicians. We have a lot of mathematicians on it, on the course, and the rest in, in finance and economics. So, you know, we just, uh, the important thing is really metals and energy finance, which mining is a component but I would say that the financial accounting course is as important, and there's a full course in mathematical techniques and finance. You know, so it's, it's mathematics and it's the stochastic issues. It's uh, the more important course is geostatistics, where you're looking at probabilistic uncertainty and estimation of resources, whether they be uh, minerals or oil, and then interfacing that with quantitative finance. With the black controls and the derivatives, uh, you know, and the hedging. Uh, and and the like, so and real option valuations. So what I like about that's what this we do. How, what I like about this is how real world and practical this information seems. Like it seems like direct. Uh, you can apply as you're saying about some of those other guys that would take the course and then start plugging in the numbers immediately. Like it seems like very practical. Yeah. Uh, well, our, our graduates are or in in um, what have been. Uh, um, uh, in very much in demand. I mean, we're watching closely what's happening now because, you know, the traditional, uh, you know, going into the office for the first time is going to be different. Uh, but traditionally, uh, there there are, is a high demand. The mobility of the graduates is is breathtaking. Uh, so we've we've now got uh, you know several hundred. Uh, we've been running the course now for uh, a good uh, fourteen years now. And the mobility is, is breathtaking. The graduates are in demand in new business development in natural resources. Uh, it is in the boutiques uh, and, and also entrepreneurs, several of the students. So I don't have to be employed. I'm going to start my own company, you know, and that we, we do do a full course in entrepreneurship as well. 
um, which is, you know, then uh, gives people that independence. That sounds, uh, again, it sounds very useful. Uh, before we wrap up, a uh, quick sort of real world sort of, uh, or less theoretical, let's say, uh, have you been looking at earnings? It looks like some of these mining companies uh, in the last week or so, they're starting to put out earnings and it sounds like they're knocking it out of the park. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Earnings, you know, making money. Yeah, like have you been looking at the company oh, of course, earnings? You know, I, I've, I've heard uh, comments from uh, Chris Hind about uh, the gold mining sector um, making ridiculous amounts of money. I don't have any real difficulty with that. Uh, I know that his argument is that you're taking stuff out of the ground and putting it back into a bank vault. What's the point? Well, right. I, I, yeah. but, but at the same time, you know, look, let's not knock it. It, it is offering a livelihood for a lot of people. <laughs> so, you know, if, if, if the gold mining industry is making embarrassing amounts of money, well, all strength to their arm, all I can say. You know, it, it's, uh, it's hardly subsidizing the other aspects but you know there were there were all sorts of um spikes i mean the vanadium price uh you you know just went crazy and you know that's the that's our business isn't it uh, where we got this high volatility which is why you need to understand finance so you can uh, apply a real option valuation by doing a rear view mirror on price volatility and then projecting into the future and being able to understand how to apply those. So I, I think it's it's great when you have high volatility because you know it, it hardly subsidizes, but it certainly just keeps the enthusiasm for metals on the boil. And I, I, I can't see that dying away, but you know, people will always need metals in our society. I mean, think of the amount of copper that's used in a, a, an electric um, vehicle, you know, it's it, it, the amount of aluminium being used. It, it, it just drives it. And if gold is providing its usual um, baseline of keeping some companies viable and uh, people in, in uh, gainful employment, then I think it's fantastic. Well, that's excellent. Well, we'll have to maybe have you and Chris Hind on at some point and you guys can <laughs> check it out over the practicality of gold. I, for me, it, it always seems like it's... Uh, I mean, the surreal thing about buying gold, which I did about 10 years ago when I first started getting interested in the sector, and I went to Scotiabank, Scotia yeah. Mercado or what, Mercado, whatever it was called. And when you hold the gold and your hand goes down and you feel how heavy it is and you see the kind of surprisingly orangey color, yeah. and I, I, it was a surreal moment for me because was, all of a sudden I understood, oh, this is money. You know, like there, it's such an easy association to make. Yeah. Oh, it's this is that is the point yeah. Yeah. It, it is yeah it is the ultimate store of, of wealth and converted into earnings and i mean what is you know great seeing the um multiplying effect it has on the share price mm -hmm. uh, and so you know people then scrambling to say well look you know what is the basis of this underlying asset you know, but i see this uh, wonderful opportunity the uh, project uh, has only got another four uh, years of my life, and I hope that the geologists are spending some of this uh, money coming in on exploration to keep the thing going. You know, and, and out of that, it's some all sorts of exciting science comes out of it. You know, our understanding of natural science uh, and geology from the, you know, on the back of uh, money spent uh, and generated in gold uh, is just taken, you know, everything just forward, which applies just as much to, say, a porphyry system. And so the underlying science is very similar. Who can say, you know, you, you put a boundary condition, don't do this. This is not actually uh, worth anything. I, I, don't, I wouldn't uh, go along with that. Very interesting. Well, thank you for joining us, Dennis. Uh, any parting thoughts before you go, uh, just about what you're up to and uh, anything on the industry, comments on the industry before we go? No, the, I, I, thank you for inviting me in. And uh, just really to reiterate that, of course, when we read the news, it's, you know, yet another lockdown and the um, the consequences this has on people's livelihood, particularly in retail and leisure and so on. Uh, but there are sectors which which are, um, it's been, it's kick-starting and requiring people to uh, apply new technology driven, you know, through the internet and exciting tools and just really forcing that 
And for some of us, I really do feel it's it's a great privilege to be part and parcel of uh, this 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 new uh, way that we do things. So thank you for inviting me in to listen to my views. It's uh, much appreciated, Adrian. Yeah, you're welcome, Professor Dennis Buchanan. Come back again and tell us about when you have a new course lined up. You just tell us, and uh, we'll we'll ask you to talk about it. Great, thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Very good. I hope you enjoyed my interview with the ever-charming Professor Dennis Buchanan of Imperial College London. Another rock in the mosaic, another piece of glass in the stained glass window, another piece of the puzzle in our journey into the mining world. Maybe we'll have Dennis and Chris Hind debate over the merits of gold. A philosophical discussion. All alchemists welcome. Don't forget about the Northern Miners Global Mining Symposium next week, northernminer.com slash GMS. And until next week, take care.